Okay, team. Oh, eventually, eventually I'll get there. Sound, no sound. And my chat didn't pop up. There we go. We'll solve that later. Okay, finally got there uh, for the, what do we got? Six, seven people? Uh, <laughs> now's where we should go over all of the exam bits of information now, eh? Doesn't that uh, work out spectacularly well? I'm sure everyone would be stoked. What we are going to go over today is the freedom of information. Uh, legislation and common law rules. Now, uh, this is examinable. Both this and, and the material for next week are examinable. And I think I'm going to go and give you guys specific tips in terms of what um, what you're going to need to know in order to uh, to smash that out. Uh, I believe it's a ten mark question in your final exam. Now. Uh, access to information, you'll hear the, these phrases get bandied around a little bit, rights to information, uh, freedom of information, uh, and similar um, uh, terms that get thrown around. But really for the purposes of what we're doing here is we, we're talking about, the, or largely we're talking about the standardary regime, particularly at the federal level. Uh, I've handed out an example which we'll go through at some stage during the, the class. And oh, like, to be honest, I think this is probably a useful one to, to really just get a practical understanding of how the thing sets up uh, and how you go about uh, doing and finding out about uh, information in the government uh, decision-making process. All right, so uh, there's two broad things that we're going to have to um, follow in terms of learning outcomes. Is One is to talk about the function and its importance. Uh, and again, it's really that, I guess if we sort of step back and look at this in terms of where it sits in our responsible system of government, we really want to look at, well, how, you know, not just how do we go about doing this, but why? Why is this important? Why do we have these processes in place? And in doing that, we, we're really going to be going through the statutory regime um, because, as I'll talk about later on, the, the common law rules for, uh, for information requests are, are very uh, sparse. Now, um, uh, the, the section numbers that I've used are from the, uh, the federal legislation, um, but you can also use and follow. And again, I do recommend when prepping for your final exam for this particular subject to go through and find out what the equivalent sections are in the uh, Queensland statute, or the 2009 statute. But largely I'll be referring to the, the federal sphere here. So starting from, um, I guess, a really theoretical uh, point is that idea that knowledge is power. This is not a legal concept, it's a philosophical one. And people have known, people, human beings have known for a long time that information, both giving it to people and holding it away from people, has a really strong impact on uh, politics on the way that we go about um, structuring our government, structuring our leadership, structuring our society. You guys might have heard of uh, Cambridge, is it Cambridge Intelligentsia? Cambridge, um, the, <laughs> the AI guys, oh, I can't remember the name, the name escapes, I think it's Cambridge Analytica. Yeah, did that name sound familiar, that, that particular name or phrase? It was the, the entity, it's a privately run software uh, house that does AI, big data analysis. And what they did on, on behalf, ostensibly, of the Trump 
campaign in the 2016 US election was to specifically target social media of marginal voters and to really to politicize this. And it was really interesting because it was an example of using of big data. It was the first time this had been done uh, in order to change the outcome of an election. And there's a fair amount of evidence out there that it had a, a significant contribution to the final result of the, uh, of the 2016 election, uh, which you guys are very much aware was won by Mr. Trump. Now, this guy, Ralph Nader, he's uh, an American. He was a politician for a while, and he was, he's a, a lawyer. And he was, he, I believe he might have even run for presidency a long time ago, 30 years ago. Um, and very much had sort of fought out against some of the grave injustices that happened, both in the large um, political and government environments, but also with corporates as well. Um, and so he's a big a champion of corporate, uh, corporate responsibility and responsible and transparent government. This idea of transparency, government decision making, being open for all to see. Um, and again, this, this particular part, I guess from the philosophical framework, has a lot of these, these sort of metaphors. Uh, another one is, sunlight is the best disinfectant. That if all of the government's decision-making processes and policies and what they talk about is made open to the public, then we, as citizens, can see what's happening. And maybe we'll, you know, we'll feel sufficiently <laughs> often enraged enough to do things about it. Or if we see that, look, these guys are genuinely trying, hey, maybe you should carry on trying. Yeah, have another term. Um, James Madison was, I believe, one of the early American um, constitutionalists. I'm not sure whether he contributed to the original design of their constitution. He might have come a bit after that in the 18, uh, early to mid-1800s. Uh, popular government without popular information or the means of acquiring it is a prologue to a farce or a tragedy or perhaps both. Okay, um, the next thing to look at is the naming of these. Now, we see this FOI, and you would have heard that, I'm sure, FOI requests. That sound at least rings a bell with something. I mean, you literally, you've got one next to you on that piece of paper. Um, freedom of information. That is a person making a, an application under the federal framework in order to get something out of a federal government body, some information from them. And that can be uh, a combination of, of documents and, and or reasons for uh, deciding a particular way. Come back to that. Um, just note the Queensland government, this is quite interesting actually, they made this change really uh, after seeing some feedback from some, I loosely say, experts in this area who thought that the name Freedom of Information uh, wasn't didn't really convey um, the idea that the citizen, the citizen is the, is the person who should be empowered to have this information. It's theirs by right, rather than the government and its um, you know, magnanimous self giving this stuff up willingly. And so they actually changed the name of, of, the, legis of the governing legislation when they did a, a rewrite in 2009. And so in Queensland and I believe Tasmania, we use the, the phrase right to information, or right of information, R-T-I, R-O-I. Um, and it's, it's, it's just the same thing. It's the same thing as the federal one. Um, but note that access to information is a broader term. That's the umbrella term to describe um, sort of all of the, um, the rights of citizens and interested persons to go to the government and get information from them rather than this, I guess, more narrow statutory regime that we use for, um, for making these specific requests. And we've already talked about this um, uh, uh, statement of reasons. We talked about that when we did the um, remedies component for this subject. 
Um, statement of reasons, of course, is a formal structured uh, description of the steps and facts, statement of the facts that a particular government body um, put together in order to reach a final decision. Okay, and so really there's, there's, three, there's three components to do with this access for information in terms of how information uh, is, is really is controlled by the government and the relationship between the citizen and the government in terms of the citizens being able to see these things, to be able to think for themselves. Um, and they fall in three sort of th three sort of categories. One is the FOI structured rules for getting the information. And that's really the bulk of what I'll talk about today. Um, this particular um, subject and this particular lecture doesn't actually go into the privacy legislation at all. Um, you won't be assessed on it, I'm not going to delve into it, um, but you're welcome to go and, and do some further reading. Probably after uh, 12.30 p.m. on the 13th of November uh, 2018, but um, you're welcome to, to go through and have a look at that. Um, and again, this, this third part, the statements of reason, the reason why we have this, this third component is that is the thing that the person who seek, who are usually grieved by a particular decision of government um, uses as the basis to go off either for merits or for judicial review uh, of particular decisions. So that these are the important mechanisms, but the, most of what we're talking here is is going to be on this um, the actual access of access to information and the FOI rules. Any questions so far? So, freedom of information. Uh, we'll start with the common law. You notice with a lot of areas of law that you get taught at university, and I've harped on about this, even in admin law, where we talk about the common law rules before we go through the statutory regime. And we talk about the contract law rules for common law rules because that largely is contract law, and the stat regime sort of sits over the top of it. Um, whereas for things like judicial review, uh, yeah, we talk about the common law rules, but the statutory regime, you know, very heavily sits over the top of that. You're essentially working and operating within a stat regime. Um, with the common law rules for freedom of information, there's really not a lot to say. Um, the courts, for a long time, have actually just said, no, no, you don't have a deep-seated common law right since time immemorial to actually obtain um, government records. So the common law is actually, and this is really interesting because we, we think of the common law, particularly the common law evolving in terms of um, get, generally giving citizens rights and over time becoming less harsh on the citizen and more harsh on the government. And this is an interesting area because the common law freedom of information is essentially nothing. You don't get this power to go through and get these things. And, uh, and this came to a head in this case in the 80s. Um, one of the final ones that, uh, oh, it's got Gibbs, actually Chief Justice Gibbs, um, had, uh, had sat on in the 80s. Now, this was an appeal um, from, I believe it was an employee grievance decision that the, it was an appeal from New South Wales and the president of the Court of Appeal in New South Wales at the time was actually um, the Honourable Michael Kirby. And Kirby, as yes, those that may have been to the 2018 Mayo lecture would know, is, um, is a very progressive gentleman. And the, this idea of the rights of citizens being sacrosanct and the burdens that places on government being kind of far less relevant uh, Kirby very much was standing on the side of the citizen. Now, uh, Chief Justice Gibbs didn't really subscribe to that sort of philosophy. Some, some might even argue that he was at the, the, the other, end of, um, other end of the spectrum in a whole host of ways. And so Chief Justice Gibbs in the High Court uh, gave a very scathing 
uh, decision, uh, overturning the, um, the decision in the New South Wales Court of Appeal. And he restated very legalistically that there is no requirement. The common law has never actually said that statements of reasons or access to government documents is required. It was never actually stated in the common law. It's never been ruled. Oh, look, the fact Parliament does it, well, that's, that's fine. Parliament can do as Parliament does. The common law doesn't accept that. And even, even when it's the exercise of a statutory power, um, and when the person does have or you know, has some form of le legitimate expectation, either way, the common law doesn't give the rights for peace people to go and interfere with government business uh, by seeking these sorts of, uh, these sorts of uh, documents. They just don't. Well, there we go. That's the first point. We don't, by the way, expect you guys necessarily to talk about your common law, common law stuff. I mean, you possibly can in the exam, but it's a, just a key thing to know that this is almost entirely a creature of statute. All right, now the next slide is a little back to front in that we're talking about um, really the, the purpose in terms of why we have this freedom of information legislation. But this, you know, these particular four categories are actually been done ex post facto. So they've been done by reviews into the system a long time after it was put into place. Um, and just note that the fourth one, as you could probably work out, was included at a later stage. Oh, there we go. You've got, there's two reports there. Yeah, I probably should have posed that as a question for you guys, but you may be able to work this out. What changed between 1979 and 2013 to do with government information? What changed? The internet changed and information technology changed. And so as well as the, these first three uh, pillars that um, FOI is, is just a generally good thing for individuals to be able to actually go and see what the government's doing about them, particularly if what they're doing isn't actually correct. It gives people the, the opportunity to go and correct things. And really that's power to the, to the people, to the citizen, the individual to go and see these things and to correct these things. Um, and you know, in some ways that really ties into our idea of almost a, a strong capitalist, uh, economics-driven, desire-driven society. Um, if it's something happened to me and I can see that, look, I have the incentive to go and try and redress this particular wrong. I, I'm encouraged to do that. It's to my, I benefit from it. It increases my utility from going and seeing these things through and me putting effort into doing that. And I can only do that if I can actually see whether things have been done right or wrong. Um, the second one, the FOI enhances transparency. Um, this is not just to do with uh, governance, but it's also to do with uh, uh, efficiency as well. Things that are more transparent or more open to critical in many ways makes um, particular government processes and decisions liable to scrutiny. And that scrutiny, often it's not very positive, but sometimes it can be. Sometimes the public feedback can be taken on board and they can actually um, change what they're doing, do things better, doing government processes better. We think about, uh, is anyone here doing business, starting business as a degree, it's just a couple of years, three years back? Half the class, all three of you, um, if in, in that situation, you guys will talk, you look at um, strategy and you look at examining your own internal processes um, as part of auditing, as part of business strategy and management. And these um, techniques apply to government as well. Um, each of the you know, government ministries do as part of their own internal reviews. They're, you know, they, they're still obliged to not waste public money. Part of doing that, making their systems more efficient, sometimes is taking in uh, public feedback. Government, you know, people that are saying, hey, look, this, this, and this is really inefficient. Look, I might have suffered personally as a result of this being inefficient. Here's my feedback. Can you do something about it? Uh, the third one, that the community 
that's better informed can participate more effectively in the democratic process. Oh, and again, go back to this Cambridge Analytica thing. Knowledge is power. If we know what the government is doing and we can see their processes and they are made more open, then we can make more informed decisions on voting. We can pick the um, particular people who hold themselves out as candidates, oh, which doesn't always work, of course, in party politics, and certainly doesn't work very well for proportional voting. But anybody that sat through the Senate voting form when they had the double dis dissolution a few years back, knew and go and tick those, and la label them from 1 to 114, or however many it was. It's actually a bit of a problem, by the way. Uh, you guys may have noticed it, because if you miscount, you have to count how many there are, then start with the least likely. I think it was 114 in our, um, in our, for our Senate this, that time around, and rank them in order. Um, now, the, this final one is interesting, and this only came up in the 2013 review, and that said that you know, information, as well as being um, a powerful thing in the broad philosophical sense, actually has value in the real information age that we live in now. Um, the idea that you and your personal information and all of the processes and decisions that government makes can be data mined. And as a result, the, this information itself is a valuable thing. It is a resource. Australia, again, relative to almost all countries in the world, like probably bar maybe 10 or so, um, largely European nations, Australia has just top-notch administrative law, um, best practice in a whole host of areas. We may not think it when we see our government go off and do this and other thing. And Australia is a very wealthy country. It can kind of afford to do such things. But the information that is created by our civil service is worth something. We see that now. Um, anyway, that's that's why we do this. And look, just before I move on, um, this is the sort of thing yeah, I want you guys to contemplate for your, your exam question for this particular um, part as well. All right, so the, the freedom of information legislation, the regime, um, comes, there's really six core uh, features, core sort of requirements, core uh, key aspects that they really wanted to try and implement when doing this. So, um, level of access, uh, vari varied level of success for each of these. But um, so equality of access. A citizen, any citizen, can go and ask for information. Um, and it's really being able to make this, not just um, giving people the right, the ability to this, also make it quite low cost. Um, by default, the application fees, and this varies by jurisdiction, but I believe, I actually believe the federal jurisdiction at the moment, I actually think they have a zero dollar fee. I'd have to check that. Might have been late, but it's not much. Doing a freedom of information request will cost you less than $50. Um, unless they need to go and get more information and get that to you and photocopy it. And they'll, they usually do a preliminary analysis and say, hey, look, this is going to be expensive. We reckon it's going to cost this much and we want you to pay 15% you know, of that. Um, you know, cough up another $400 or whatever have you. Um, the courts, by the way, have actually looked at this quite stringently too. A couple of cases where they, they have gone... Um, where people have actually complained that their freedom of information requests ended up costing you know, five or six hundred dollars, and the courts have said, "Yeah, yeah, you're right. It should be less than that. Um, chop it down to ninety, something similar." Um, that's the first thing. The, the equality. Oh, another thing to note about equality of access is an point, uh, important point to note. In the federal legislation, there's no re prescribed form. They'll give you a form. You can use it if you want to, but if you just write on a napkin what you want, you can submit that. I'd like to know about my Auntie Irma. Here you go. And the way, the way it's structured, government department, relevant government departments, actually have to make an effort to assist you in turning this into something congruent as well. OK, 
So that's that first thing to know. We want anyone to be able to go and do this without needing to know much about the law, without having to be very literate, without having to be very wealthy. The second thing about the statutory regime is that it is a right, not a privilege. You do not need to seek leave from a government department, an official or a judicial officer in order to request this information, demand it, and for them to at least give it a go at finding it. You have a right to this information. It's not something you have to request or ask for or make an argument in order to receive. That's a, a, key, uh, a key plank as part of this, uh, this regime. You have the right to, to get this information. You also have the right, if information is withheld, and again, we're going to talk about that in the second half of this lecture, you have a right to uh, an appeals process. That appeals process, it varies, again, by the, the standard instrument that you're going through and doing. Um, the FOI request in, the various, I believe the various uh, government departments have their own internal processes as well for doing these things. Um, and if you don't like that, then you do have this ability to go uh, through the process with, the, with a commissioner, an independently uh, appointed person, who will go through and re-examine the government decision. And they, unlike you, have and can read the information. So essentially they've appointed a, a commissioner um, for freedom of information. They will be able to look at the information and make a determination as to whether or not the, the relevant government department has actually gone through and you know, actually reasonably held all of the arguments that they've had for withholding the information from you. Uh, there's an onus reversal. What does that mean? The government department, by default, have to give you the stuff if they've got it. Right? It is up to for them to prove. And we know, as law students and future legal professionals, really what that means and how important it is. It's important because if they don't manage to discharge, they have to go and do that. They have to discharge the zones. And if they don't, you win by default. So by default, they must give the stuff to you. Um, that's that's a, uh, a key plank uh, in this. Um, they have to uh, publish. Now, not only do they, well, clearly they don't publish your information, what they do have to publish are the steps that an applicant has to go through in order to make these things. They have to be active in giving people advice, and this is lay people, not legal people. The, the various government departments must uh, carefully go through and map out the steps that a person needs to go through in order to get their information. Um, not necessarily their information, anyone's information, um, uh, provided they meet whatever the standing requirements are. And finally, there's that presumption. The presumption is, if you ask for stuff, you're going to get it. Uh, that, that is the starting point with this freedom of information legislation. That we have this, it's really, it's, the information, as citizens, the information is ours. We are the, are the citizens, right? You, you, you know, by default, we're going to get it. Governments have to work, or the relevant government uh, officials and bodies have to work to really try and rebut this and stop this. Does that make sense? These things there, these are sort of the, the hallmark, hallmarks of the uh, FOI regime. Okay, turning to the uh, mechanical stuff. I didn't put the name of the statute, it's the Freedom of Information Act. Um, but I have put the objects section in here. And for those who are in the tube, which is most of the class, um, we looked at the objects of a quite different piece of legislation. Um, so something to note, when you guys are ex uh, examining or exploring a statutory regime that you don't know anything about and you've never seen before, it's helpful to go through and just quickly read the objects of the Act. Why? Because we know, after doing stat interpretation at stage one, and then stat interpretation of pretty much every subject since then, that the, um, the, the various statutory presumptions in the Act's Interpretations Act, uh, and particularly the purpose of approach, is going to apply for these things. And we also know for admin law, 
when governments are, are going and making these decisions and we're determining things like ultra varies and, and such like, um, we can take into account various, um, you know, the, the, the underlying purpose of the legislation itself. Very, very helpful place to start is the objects of the Act. And you'll, you'll note that this kind of aligns with some of those things I just talked about in the previous slide. Um, but that's really the, sort of the purpose of the regime. Um, there is one, though, that I'll return to at the very end of the lecture. Uh, <laughs> the last five words of that section. At the lowest reasonable cost. Because as you can imagine, these things can really, really cost a lot of money when people are going through and making a lot of these requests, particularly when the marginal cost of doing so is zero. So, government has some, uh, some information, I want it. What do I need to do? Well, first thing I've got to do is make a request. They have to be done in writing. You can't do it over the phone. Uh, I can do it in email. I'm not sure I'd have to double check that. Um, but it, it has to be in writing, but it does not have to be in a prescribed specific form, uh, at least not under the statutory regime. I actually would have to check the Queensland one. It probably does there. Queensland government likes, I think I mentioned this in the chat. Queensland government does like having forms, and they're usually terribly drafted and structured forms. Like, here's your address, and it's only this wide. Or here's your email address, and it's only about two centimetres wide. Um, yeah, good, good thinking there, guys. Um, so just make note, it has been writing, and the relevant agency must assist the applicant. If they receive an application and they don't understand it, they have a positive duty to go contact the person and help them to draft this thing out. I mean, they don't have to map it out every little bit and piece to achieve the exact thing, but in, in rough terms, they do have to assist the applicants in doing it. Um, they have some time frames, and that they have to acknowledge the request within 14 days of receipt, and then they have to have it done within 30. And that's not 30 after the 14, that's 30 after you've done the application. If they can't, and that's a pretty common thing, they will contact you and negotiate uh, an extension um, with that, and they, they do have the power to do that, take reasonable steps if it's going to do that. And particularly, they also have to notify you if it's going to cost a lot more money. If they have to go, particularly if they have to go into long-term uh, archival places, physical places, physically send one to a physical archive to do that. Not everything's digital. Okay, now in terms of what you get, they can uh, produce copies or they can give you a reasonable time to actually inspect the original uh, documents. I'm not too sure whether or not they can do either or or both, whether they get the discretion. I was just reading the statute, no. I couldn't determine. I think, it's, I think they probably get the, choose, the choice to do either or, but I would suspect if somebody um, said you could inspect the originals, and all, like most of these things, most of the originals are going to be in Canberra, it's not reasonable for a person in Townsville to be given seven days to inspect stuff in Canberra. That doesn't make any sense. Just email it to me. Just email it. Um, and if they do refuse in part or in entirety, in entirety, uh, to give you all the information, they have to tell you why. They must issue a statement of reasons when doing that. Now, Yeah, we'll flick over that. What? There are specific reasons for them not doing it. Remember that they, they're the onus of proving this. And this is this key part in FOI and FOI requests. The gov relevant government agency must rely on one of these things. And if you do get involved in this at some stage in your legal career, it's going through and analysing the various points that they've made in order to try and fight them. Remember, essentially, you're going to be the respondent uh, in this part. They're going to be the, the ones that going to have the bear the onus to prove it. Okay. 
And so I'll, I'll bring the list up. Bring the list up. There's lots of them. Ooh, the font might be a little small. Um, as always, I'll, I'll turn this into a Word document and put it on LearnJC as well. Um, and I believe there's actually, a, might be a few more than that. From memory, I thought there were 15 uh, things, but I'll, I'll, I'll double check that. Um, now, some of these are going to seem pretty straightforward. Um, a, docu a cabinet documents. There are things that don't need to be released under an FOI request. Um, electoral rolls, things at the bottom. Um, some of them, though, are <laughs> going to be a little bit tricky. Uh, things involving secrecy provisions, deliberations in policy formation, documents affecting enforcement of law and protection of public safety, uh, trade secrets, uh, material obtained in confidence, and documents containing personal uh, information. In fact, oh, I can see one that I haven't. Uh, affecting enforcement of law, protection, public safety. Yeah, actually, I, I think I've missed one out as well, which is, have I got 47 there? Oh, no, it is down the bottom. Yeah, personal information. All right, what we might do now is have a look. We'll spend, oh, I'll spend a little bit, a little, little bit of time now. Do you guys, do we want to have a, a break now and then come back and have a look at, we'll go over this particular document, the FOI document you guys have got there, or do you want to go through the document now and then have a break? Break first or break later? Who wants break first? Who wants break later? Well, that was conclusive. We'll go through. No, we'll have a have a break now. We're going to come back in five minutes. My voice is a bit. Ugh. Give us five.
Okay. So in front of us, all those that are here, and I don't think there's an easy way I can do this, sadly, for the, uh, for the externals. I could possibly use the document care. Ca in fact, I will. I'll use the document, um, uh, what, are they, what do they call this? Document viewer? Let's have a look. Let's see if we can get up here. Document camera, that's what it's called. And I'll get this up and going. I don't use these very often, so feel, um, please don't be uh, very disappointed if I uh, manage to be quite poor in, in this process. Uh, in fact, very poor. Mm -hmm. Oh, there you go. Oh. He's spluttering to life. No, it's not spluttering to life. Okay. Yes. Something's happening. Oh, look at that. So, this is a freedom of information uh, request. It's got got my old address on it, so feel free not to send terrible email, uh, terrible postal mails to that. Um, it's a request I made about, oh, was it 2014? Early 2014, um, to the department, then the, known as the Department of Immigration and Citizenship. What's it called these days? Anyone know? It's, so, it's something similar. I think they just tacked on the end, and border control. Uh, I believe the Abbott government changed that at some stage. But this is a freedom of information request uh, involving uh, a document. In this case, a recording. I actually wanted an electronic copy of uh, an interview. Uh, long story short, my uh, brother is a little bit uh, rougher uh, than myself, and he got in a bit of trouble as a young lad, as one does at age 18 and was charged with, uh, after a fight with assault, the, the Queensland equivalent of assault occasioning bodily harm. And you guys, most of you study crim law at some stage, and you guys are aware of the, uh, how the sentencing regime works here, where the magistrates, particularly for your first few offences, are very, very reluctant to give you a conviction. You might, you might or may not be aware of this, I'm not sure. Um, in New Zealand, they operate quite a different scheme. And so you, on first application, the police actually choose. Rather than put you before the courts, they choose to not charge you, and they put you on a series of diversionary scales. So the police have discretion to do that, rather than the magistrate uh, equivalent uh, choosing to award convictions or not. Um, another part of the sentencing regime over there is, is suspended sentences. And so he received a suspended sentence of between one and two years um, after being in the watch house equivalent for about a week. Um, he said, oi, go away. Don't do anything naughty for the next few years and, you know, and time serves. And that's fine. So anyway, turns out though, uh, if you arrive in Australian shores as a New Zealander and you have a sentence of over 12 months, you cannot get the, what we call a triple four visa. Uh, that's the visa that Kiwis receive on entry after 2001 uh, that you get by right. You cannot get one of those. And my younger brother, being a uh, big, burly, stroppy lad, was, would have got quite stroppy, I imagine, with the officials. And they have taken him away and interviewed him. And I, you know, obviously, these days being a solicitor, I thought I would just go through and have a look and see whether they'd followed the appropriate um, uh, procedure. So I got, um, I did my freedom of request, I don't have the original request itself, but I, I did get the um, document back from uh, the uh, Department of Immigration, where they get um, specific people, There's, they have usually an FOI team of people that'll go and do these things. And um, the first thing they do uh, in these things uh, is to um, clearly go through and demonstrate that this is a request that we're clear about what it is that we're doing and that I, you know, this particular person has the power to do that. This is a stock standard FOI response. 
that's a stock standard response when doing, doing these things. And remember that what, what I've just talked about with FOI requests, that by default, they must give you the information. And here, I required the audio copy of the, um, of the interview that happened. I believe it was in 2007. Now, um, so this first page is going over the information and demonstrating that this person has the power uh, to do this. Again, very much in the same vein as the stuff that I talked about in the previous few slides, they are obliged to give you this stuff. I mean, this is a reply to a Freedom of Information request. How many pages is it? Seven, eight, nine? I think it's nine pages. It's a few. And they must tell you about the rights of review. So if you disagree with the FOI um, release, which usually you're going to do if, um, if you've requested documents and they don't give them to you, uh, that it tells you about your rights, your rights to review these things. Um, and note that the way they've described this here for these two different ways of doing this particular uh, review. One is an internal review where you can go back to the same team and ask for an internal review. Now, usually this will be with another officer. It always is. And they will go over and check things. Now, this, from, from your guys' perspective, again, if odds are good in your legal and personal lives, you're going to be involved with these at some stage. It may be helpful to know or to think about whether or not, when looking through this document, it's worth going through the internal process or, as they've rightly pointed out here, going directly to the commissioner. And this forms part of your legal strategy. Now, we don't really talk about much this at an undergrad level because it's something that we always sort of expect that you develop as a practitioner. If you do end up actually involved in the active practice of law, uh, preparing documents, making arguments, and advising clients, that you're going to have and start to develop strategic ways of dealing with, with uh, legal matters to assist your clients. And so if you guys put your heads in the situation of, of, of the person here, or me in this case, after receiving this information, would I want them to go and do an internal review? Or would I want something to go directly to the commissioner? Um, and again, we'll go through the factual uh, information here, whether or not we would want to skip that, this particular process. And I'll explain what I actually did uh, at the end um, and why. And also note at the very bottom, they also have a complaint procedure. This doesn't have any legal impact on your case, but, and it, it's not uncommon, by the way, guys, to have situations where people are just angry they're just angry. They're angry about the process. They feel like they haven't been treated properly as a person. Right? And this sometimes can actually be independent of the result itself. Usually it's not. Usually people aren't angry about the process. Um, they're not angry about uh, things. They're just angry about the actual result. Um, it's like people saying that they will need to, they need to appeal this decision just on the principle of it. I'm like, no, nah, mate, you're doing it just for the money. Be honest to yourself. All right, so it's got a complaint section as well. So I'll flick that to the next part. All right, and it's got some contact details there as well and the, the particular officer. Um, I think you actually contact them directly. Next page, uh, what's that there? Charter. Again, this is all very, if you notice that this is very, almost like customer service type uh, information that you're receiving back as a client rather than it being this nasty, harsh, adversarial government um, series of steps. Um, the charter, of course, being an internal document, but it's, it'll be part of this, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in terms of this, this strategy, that they use the tools of business. Hey, how can we do this better? Not just to make it more efficient, spend less public money, but also deliver a high quality service uh, as well. People everywhere, uh, it, have, or sometimes are forced to, find better ways of doing what they do. I think that's part of uh, just living in the information age, thinking about doing sometimes small things 
better. All right, the next part is the uh, record of the decision itself. So again, it restates uh, the information. Now I've mm, hopefully properly redacted that. That scribble, by the way, is not FOI department scribble. That's Simon Walker scribble, just over my um, brother's information. Uh, so I hope you can't see through it, but it's possible you can. All right, so here, it, the first thing they're talking about is what is, what are you actually seeking? What's the subject matter we're looking here? Um, so here, uh, I just wanted the Refuse Entry file, which they did supply, and the audio recording of the interview, there we go, from uh, October to 2007. Well, okay, and they're going and, <laughs> and considering each of the following. No, when we think about this in the admin law uh, context, sure, the Freedom of Information Act, no data, well, that kind of makes sense. That's the statute, the statute framework you're operating under. Uh, you have to consider that and the objects and purposes of that as well while doing that. But other things too, so the, um, the handbook and the commissioner's guidelines. Remember that the commissioner is an independent body or person that's established in order to go through and check and review these things. Um, and I'll go through some of the commissioner decisions later in the lecture as well. Okay, and so they talk about this. So they're, 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 she's also put in, the relevant agent has put in the um, section 22, um, which is the preparing of edited copies and deletions. Uh, not sure whether they have but anything about deletions. I don't think they have any deletion of exempt matter, like in the document itself, they've just not refused, uh, sorry, they've just refused certain documents there because they've deemed it to be exempt. Now, this is where, uh, uh, this is where things get interesting. Have you had a read of this so far? If you guys just have a quick read of that page. Tell me if anything seems odd about that page. So have a quick read. Let's see if I can zoom this in. Yeah. Any thoughts, anyone, about anything that looks really odd? No? Are you still going? What do you guys reckon? No, you didn't find anything. Else. What about this bit here, where it's talking in relation to the section twenty-four A documents cannot be found or do not exist, and then it's got the following actions the staff person took. Just have a read of that that paragraph. What the person, what this particular agent has actually done to try and find that audio recording. Is it on there? And then the next sentence. Am I taking crazy pills here? The, literally, the agent couldn't open the file, then claimed that the document doesn't exist, therefore refused access. Yeah, she couldn't open it. It didn't have the right codex on a computer. She literally didn't know how to use Windows Media Player or didn't have appropriate access to download the appropriate software to open it. And therefore has concluded the document does not exist. Now, 
like, I mean, perhaps this is a tad unfair uh, because uh, obviously I don't, I am a solicitor and work in IT for a long time. But I looked at that and I burst out laughing. I couldn't, I really just, I couldn't get my head around it, how somebody could have made that conclusion based on the previous sentence. So that was the reasoning that's used there. Now, in terms of reasoning, remember how we talk about statements of reasons and how these statements of reasons are the things which are then used later on in order to seek some form of uh, appeal or some other rights to go through and do that. So here I've looked at that, read it, and said, you look, you've got the file, you've opened it up, and you don't know how to open an audio file on your computer, and then concluded that it doesn't exist. Sounds just, just monumentally just absurd. Um, but you can't put that in a structured reply we have to think like lawyers. What does that actually mean? Well, I'll return to that part there. We're going to look at this section, this next part here, the public interest conditional exemptions. Because this is a, a separate argument. Okay. Now, this section 47, uh, capital C, I hope I've got it in there somewhere, and I think that might be the one I've left off. Yeah, I thought so. I was just looking through that, trying to work out which one was and wasn't in there. It's not on my list on the screen. I will put that in. Um, uh, for you guys as well, but this is a this public interest um, defence, if that's for want of a better term. This is an exemption where they are trying to argue uh, that. Oh, I'll read out. I'll read out the section as, as it is under that um, there. Are, a document is conditionally exempt if the disclosure in the Act would disclose matter, a deliberative matter, in the nature of or relating to opinion, advice, or recommendation obtained, prepared or recorded, or consultation or deliberation has taken place in the course of, or for the purposes of, a deliberative processes involved in the functions of an agency, minister, uh, government of the Commonwealth, or of Norfolk Island. So, what they're trying to argue there is that under uh, whatever section 47 capital C that this release of this information which she can't find because she can't open it on a computer is somehow prejudicial the prejudicial if it were to be released because it would show the deliberative processes of her particular department that particular agency Having formed the view that release of the documents would reveal deliberative documents, I then considered whether release of the documents would be contrary to the public interest. Now, I'm, I'm fascinated how that she came to that conclusion, given that she couldn't open the document on her, on her computer. This, by the way, this is the Australian Public Service, by the way. This is, um, and I'm not saying that this, you'll, get, you'll get things like this very often. But when reading through this, you, you have to look at it and go, well, this doesn't make any sense. And it doesn't. It makes no sense at all. Um, but nonetheless, she's explained it in very structured reasoning. Um, what do you think's actually happened here, by the way? What do you think what do you think's actu actually happened in terms of this part where she's talking about section 47C, capital C? What do you reckon has actually happened? I personally think there'll be some sort of template, some pro forma document that's being used in order to come to create this document here. Uh, I'd be very, very surprised if that's not the case. This person, you know, maybe she's not had a particularly good day and she's just copied and pasted things from the template without reading them or really thinking much about them at all. This happens a lot more often than you might think. That's, again, something I think you should tuck away in your, um, in your minds in terms of practice. So, there, again, this is a statement of reasons. So she's considered the following factors in favour of well, not really considered them, because she couldn't open the file. It's fine. Um, the, to do with the general public interest, informing debate. On the other hand, I consider the following reasons in favour of non-disclosure. 
and I've given the possibility of the gain of an unfair advantage, the most weight, and I am therefore satisfied the result would be contrary to the public interest. Good, good job. That was, that was, that was amazing. I, I mean, my hat off to it for managing to do that without managing to open the file. Um, all right, section 47, capital E. Um, this, all right, again, I'll read that again. Oops. Sorry, I should get that over there. That was the, that was the one I was just talking about there. Uh, so the, where I've got there, section 47, capital E, the public interest conditional exemptions for certain operations of agencies. I won't stay on this. Ah, stay there, please. A document is conditionally exempt if its disclosure under this act could, or sorry, would or could reasonably be expected to do any phone prejudice the effectiveness or procedures or methods for the conduct of tests, examinations, or audits by an agency. Prejudice the attainment of the objects of particular tests, examinations, or audits, conduct with a, or to be conduct by an agency, or have a, a substantial adverse effect on the management or assembly of personnel by the Commonwealth or by an agency. And I think that's, and then D have a ugh, substantial adverse effect on the proper and efficient conduct of the operations of an agency. For a document to be exempt under F Section 47, capital. 47 capital E subsection D, I must be satisfied there is a reasonable expectation that its disclosure will result in a substantial adverse effect on the department's operations and that there is no overriding public interest in favour of disclosure. It's my opinion the documents listed in the schedule are as exempt under section could reasonably be expected if disclosed to prejudice the effectiveness of the operations of this department. Having formed this view, I then considered whether release of the documents would be contrary to the public interest. And again, she's gone through a list of things, very similar to the previous page, and has then uh, made the final conclusion that releasing this, this information uh, is contrary to the public interest. And then the final bit's just a, the final page is just a schedule of uh, documents. So, thoughts on the Australian public sector, working and operating as effectively as they can. What do you guys reckon? What would you do if that was you, who's now come back with just this piece of babble? Uh, well, the first thing you should do as law students is seriously consider what's going to happen to your life if you end up in the FOI team. That's, no, no, that, that was a terrible joke. but. Um, it's, it is something to note that, that, in terms of quality, was appalling. That's an absolutely appalling um, response to uh, those things. I, uh, again, uh, you, you feel free to keep those, but um, uh, they're under one condition, you don't, don't copy them or circulate them, which is uh, just for you, your guys only. Um, uh, yeah, for a, a variety of reasons. Anyway, you did note there that this, the girl that, that did this FOI request is firing a um, uh, shotgun, not a sniper rifle. She's just going through, again, probably with a blind template and just copying this, 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 and this. Therefore, we're not giving you the documents. She's blindly adhering to public policy. Now, uh, I, I guess if a person was significantly more senior than me and they looked at that, they would probably be like, well, this is going to be easy. Um, what actually happened is that I did, I sort of said, look, um, can you please fix this before I like release this? Because it's, it, like, it's going to be very embarrassing for your department if I send this document on elsewhere. And they sent uh, another thing back saying, oh yeah, we're really sorry. We've gone back, got the technical team to try and open the file. It turns out that in their internal system, it was actually saved as zero bytes. So it wasn't actually her fault for not being able to open that particular file. Um, but nonetheless, I thought it was very funny. But I thought that, that whole letter from, from the Australian government was just like, and again, you, got, you guys are students of admin law. Now you can sit back and have a look at this and appreciate just how poor that was in terms of quality. Um, so 
the other thing to make note here is that I actually had the transcript already of that particular interview, like the transcript that had been made and transcribed. I just wanted the original uh, just so I could listen to it and, and double check. And to be honest, this was to do with my stroppy younger brother trying to get a visa into Australia. And he used some very colourful metaphors to describe the agents that he had to deal with in that process. And something along the lines of, I'm never, insert colourful metaphor, going to that another metaphor country ever again. Something along those lines. So in the end, it didn't make too much difference. But from an admin law perspective, I thought that was uh, quite pertinent, quite useful for you guys to have a read. Now, uh, something to note is that they, they throw the kitchen sink at this. They'll just throw this bit and that bit and this bit. So it's your, um, your purpose, usually when doing these things, to fight against them, is to have to hit each particular part. Sometimes they may have a valid point, but usually they don't, and they're laughably didn't. So, again, I've put 11 things there. Just note, one of the, I'm sure, I'm sure there was actually 15 in this list uh, of ways they can refer so I've, I've missed some off the bottom. And one of them is actually 47 capital C. Um, prejudicial to the, uh, I think it's like the administration or operation of, of agencies. Um, and that's a pretty common one that they'll go and use too. Now, also note, um, K-Rudd, like them all of them. K-Rudd was uh, an MP when I first came to live in Australia in Queensland in 2006, and he became the head of the Labour Party not long afterwards, and then became Prime Minister not long after that. And again, you may like the guy or not like the guy, it's, uh, he was very rigorous in terms of legislating a lot of, um, I guess, rights-centric things. Basically, he felt with a decent mandate, which he had in, in 2007, that he could make these changes, essentially fight against the, the machine. Um, and one of those was to make some pretty sweeping changes to FOI. And the key thing for you guys to note is that this conditional nature, some of these had this um, conditional thing and that they had to, in order to not um, do this, they had to have in check, uh, sorry, in order to satisfy one of each of these conditions, they also had to satisfy this test that it was not in the public interest to release the documents. Yeah, the relevant government department had to do that. Now, most of these didn't have that. That got put in, I believe it was 2010, that um, came into force. And so just make note, you guys are aware, different subjects that you do uh, in law, you have to have update legislation. All right, we're going, this is a subject which is, mm, tends towards needing the, the update, updated stuff. So just note, if you've got a book uh, and you're doing admin law and you're st doing a study on FOI and that book predates 2010, you probably need to find a more recent one um, because these things, the, they'll be all just different in terms of how they're structured. The sections are all still the same, but they've, re they've rejigged a few things in terms of what each of them requires of that relevant government department. Okay, um, now, um, and just make note, yeah, I said, this, this, this shotgun approach, not a sniper rifle, they will throw everything. And that lovely lass from the FOI team in New South Wales was clearly trying the kitchen sink without actually looking to see whether she had a sink to throw in the first place. Okay. Do have a look at some cases. You know, when I said there's no common law test in terms of freedom of information, that didn't mean that there's no common law in relation to this area. There's heaps of it. Um, there's also, and I haven't got any in this slide, but I'm doing some later slides. There are lots of decisions from the commissioner. When we look at, at that document, you had this right of appeal. It, but, but the internal one, and even after the internal one, you can still go to the commissioner. And the commissioner is in this unique position where it's a it is, strictly speaking, it's an arm of the executive arm of government. It's not a judicial office. I don't know think it is. Um, but they are given and set up to be, they've given a pot of money and are set up to be independent and separate from other government agencies to try and avoid political interference, to be honest. It's to stop 
ministers just calling them up and saying, Oi, we don't want this to be released. It's embarrassing to us. So uh, here, though, there's this actually some actual case law. Um, and so uh, there's, what have we got? We've got rights case. Um, so to make note, when this public interest test, it's been around for a while. I think there's, some of the cases are quite old, back like in the 80s. And they're talking about the, what does it mean to be in the interest of the public. And really, it's just it's a balance. There's a weighting factor to be done there, a balance of the interest or this need. It's been good for the public, for citizens, to be informed about the processes of government. But the, in, in corollary to that, that we don't want the essential functions of government that must be secret to be revealed everywhere. Um, this, I'll be flat out honest to those that are the five people that came to the lecture and anybody listening at home, this is a pretty important thing for you to know uh, in terms of your, your, the 10 marks that may be in your final exam. Um, not these particular cases in particular, but this weighing of the, the pros and the cons, it's pub, not just of the public interest test, but of FOI in general. What are some of the advantages and disadvantages of having these things. Um, and here in Wright's case, this went to the High Court and they were talking about the equivalent, the Victorian equivalent. Um, and look, cost does matter here. All right? The whole, um, the whole point of these things is not to just be a burden on the taxpayer and a burden on government. All right? In theory, this the release of information for public interest should help government. If people can see it, it should actually um, further the causes of good governance rather than hinder it. Um, now that's clearly not going to always be the case, you know, national secrets and such like. And government departments are usually set on lockdown mode, like again, the um, the last from the Ministry of uh, or whatever it is, the Border Control or Immigration and Citizenship back in, uh, back in 2014, where they would have had a departmental policy. Do not give out anything if you do not have to. Fight tooth and nail to stop them from getting out. Yeah, yeah, sure, on the surface, we have to help people do this and they have a right to do that, but internal government policy, you, you know, you fight. Okay. Now, um, the, uh, and that final one there, this cabinet document. So this is Sankey and Whitlam. Now Whitlam being uh, Gough Whitlam, the Prime Minister in the 70s. Um, although he wasn't Prime Minister by the time this went to court, uh, Fraser was. Because he, as we know, what happened in the 70s to Gough Whitlam? Yeah, that's the one. Good job. Hey, first year wasn't a total waste of time, eh, guys? Um, so anyway, this person wanted uh, the diaries. He actually wanted to, to have all of the cabinet. Um, discussions that, that they'd had at that time. And even though the government had changed, um, they did not want to set a, um, a precedent on this. Uh, even though the government had changed, we didn't want, we don't, even though, yeah, it was, I believe, yeah, it was a, a Lib government by the time this went to court and it was a Labour government that they were wanting the uh, cabinet documents for, they definitely didn't want to set this as a president, and the, the High Court essentially backed the government on this one. They said, no, cabinet documents, look, they need to be. You need to be able to talk about stuff without this fear, this constant fear that whatever you say is going to go straight to the media and you're going to be embarrassed. Otherwise, things end up being very furtive and secretive, and that's not what we want. We want, eventually, and you guys, you've heard, you know, the 30-year rule? 30-year rule, we're aware of, I think it's 30 years in Australia. Um, so there's a rule that says all of these documents, again, they have a different series of exemptions with a much higher bar in terms of withholding them. So most of these documents are released to the public 30 years after they were created, on the 1st of January. So all the documents created in that year are released in one big document. So for journalists and historians um, and political commentators, it's a, it's a fascinating trove of what happened, uh, what are we, so it'll be everything from 1988, what's that, it'll be the uh, Ke Keating, Keating government I think by that stage, Hawke Keating, round about that, that era, uh, the things they would have discussed at that time. And then you're coming up towards the close of the Cold War, um, the Berlin Wall, 
These are things that was, were still around when I, I was a lad. All right, now there was a case uh, in Bree Howard, in the Treasurer of the Commonwealth, 1985, um, where they, they talk about, and these are factors, they're not elements, they're not strict, hard rules on such things, but things that need to be taken into account when determining this, this test, this public interest test. Um, and uh, the first thing is the high, the level of office. So cabinet discussions, way more likely that they are not going to be disclosed. They ought not. It's in the public interest to not disclose them. Um, another one is communications in the development and promulgation of policy. In other words, the, the discussion that's made before the policy is made. All right? And sometimes these things can be you know, terse. Sometimes these things can be contradictory. Sometimes crazy things can be said. And I think um, also importantly there is that you want people to be open. And that's this next one, this third part, this um, disclosure that will inhibit frankness and candor in future pre-decisional communications. Now that's the sort of stuff that isn't appropriate to be released to the public. Because a decision is made, the process of getting to that decision, you know, we want people to throw their ideas around. Sometimes stupid ideas. Oh, maybe we should just invade you know, West Papua ourselves or some, something crazy like that might be thrown up in a discussion. And there's also context too. Something might be thrown up and it might be you know, a tongue-in-cheek or a joke or a response to something outrageous. Um, or it could, you know, there may be context and things as well. And, and again, once the decision's made, sure. But th this process of doing it, we don't want people in government to have their creativity inhibited. Uh, and yeah, again, you've got this fourth one, uh, things that lead to confusion um, and unnecessary debate from the disclosure of possibilities considered. And again, this goes back to this reasoning thing. Hey, look, we considered all of these things. One of those things we considered was having them shot, whatever as an example. Um, that may cause a, you know, a great deal of um, problems if that, if these information or these um, extreme conclusions or options that may have been considered. Look, they may have been quickly discarded, but people, as you know, have a habit of focusing on the sensational and the extreme, and, and that can get hung up on those things, even though really the final result's the key part. And uh, disclosure documents do not uh, uh, fairly disclose the reasons for decision, and subsequently may be unfair to the decision maker may prejudice the integrity of the decision-making process. That's the sort of argument that, that uh, the girl in my FOI request was trying to, um, to make there as well. Uh, that this, um, the, it's as prejudicial to the integrity of the, of the process or the decision-maker themselves may somehow be unfair to our government department if we um, disclose all of uh, this information. Uh, I've got some examples here. Now, these are not um, core cases in this particular area. These are just decisions that have been made by the commissioner. That's the citation, a AI, CMR. Now, I'm gonna, I'll go over some of these. The reason I'm going over these is not these in particular, um, and that is because, and again, whopping big exam hint here, uh, you will need examples. You're going to need examples to answer your FOI question. Examples of where information was released and wasn't released. And I don't want you using this. Please don't use that in the final exam. That's, oh, for those that can't see me, the, uh, uh, the stuff I had in the document camera. What I do want you guys to do is just a little bit of research. Take this case, for example, have a little read of it, and then jump into law site. You should all by now be aware of what law site is. You have the citation value, which, given its square brackets, does that mean you need 
the year or you don't need the year as part of the citation? Need it? Yeah, definitely need it. Square brackets means it forms part of the compound index. You must include that as part of the citation. So square brackets 2012, AICMR space 12 is the citation for this. Go into LawCite, see cases that are similar to this, similar decisions, because what you'll find is that the, uh, the various sections or arguments that are made by the uh, various bodies seeking to not release the information oh, will be different. Again, getting a variety of those, I think, maybe you know, between five and ten examples of different instances where there were arguments made um, will be very, very helpful uh, for you to draw upon when doing your final exam, even if just to get an example of a situation where it was good or bad for information to be released or not released. Uh, you know, this question may or may not be in, in more normative sense, in other words, which, what ought to be the case rather than what is the case, the strict um, uh, black letter law. All right, so here, uh, what did we have? Uh, this was a, apparently there were death threats uh, sent to climate change scientists at ANU. And so uh, the applicant was a uh, journalist, I think. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it was a journalist. Went to, to ANU and said, oh, we, we want an FOI request um, for, to see, to read these supposed death threats. And so they, <laughs> they, ANU did comply to that. They did go through, find 11 documents. But... They then argued, of course, that these were exempt. And they, uh, again, tried, this was to do with the, um, and again, the one I've looked at here is 37 sub 1 sub C, which is an exempt document if its disclosure could reasonably be expected to endanger the life or physical safety of any person. That's one of the exemption categories. And this findings is from the commissioner. Now remember, the commissioner is an independent body. It's an arm of the executive. All right. They have the power to read those documents. Part of their job, if you think about it, is like the person that can actually go through, read them, and then go, oh, yeah, fair enough, um, or not. They're independent of the various of the bodies that are uh, wanting to withhold this information. And there you go. Uh, in my view, there is a risk that release of the documents could lead to further insulting or offensive communication being directed at ANU personnel or expressed through social media. However, there is no evidence to suggest disclosure would or could reasonably be expected to endanger the life or physical safety of any person. Therefore, I consider the 11 documents not exempt under that part. So there you go. That's, uh, these are quite digestible. They're quite, uh, I guess, pretty straightforward. Um, All right, uh, next one I've got here is, the, how do you spell it, v, v de Lago, v de Lago, and Air Service Australia. Um, this is again 2008, that's this year, from the Commissioner, case number 45. And this was actually a request for the departure and arrival times of, I believe, a private jet or a series of jets owned by one of the big casinos in Melbourne. And they basically get these, you guys are probably aware, they get the high roller, big time, high net worth people, and they fly them around. They literally pay for their jets for these people to fly around to the various casinos and gamble large sums of money. That's how that works. And so these jets, because they're high net worth individuals, the casinos don't want to give this information to um, journalists. They don't want them to be able to reverse engineer and work out exactly who was it that they paid, or, you know, who was it that they were flying to and from these various locations? And again, uh, as part of that, they argued that disclosure of the request documents would place the safety of their patrons uh, at star, um, and staff at risk as the regularity of flights would be revealed. And given the financial and social status of the patrons, transporting them at, at revealed times may place them at a higher risk of interference and so put them and or the crew in danger. And again, the commissioner uh, pops up and says, look, yeah, first of all, they bear the onus of establishing 
this, as you guys are aware, that they, as the relevant uh, agency or person, they have the onus of establishing that the information should not be disclosed. And here, um, then, you know, the, the commissioner is not satisfied that they've discharged the onus and that this material could reasonably be expected to endanger the life and safety of any person. Um, you know, how, what's he got in, in 22? Having regarded the information for me, I'm not satisfied the disclosure would or could reasonably be expected to make a person a potential target of violence by another individual or group. Um, so therefore, you, you, that section 37 sub 1 sub c argument is going to fail. All right, uh, third one of these, and again, you don't have to take notes on these. Um, I've, I've put them in those slides. Again, it's under week 10 in your, um, in your in Learn JCU. It's under week 10, even though this is, strictly speaking, the material, I think Jamie has it in his week 11. Um, but I've put all of this information in, uh, under that folder if you go into uh, Learn JCU, into the, into the week 10 material. All right, what have we got here? Washington Australian Prudential Regulation Authority. Uh, this is from 2011. Oh, this is to do with uh, They are the uh, regulatory body for banking super superannuation and a couple of types of insurance. And here, the argument was under section 47, capital J. Uh, and this is to do broadly with the economy. So documents can be exempt if they would or could be reasonably expected to have a substantial adverse effect on Australia's economy by, and then there's a list of things, influencing a decision or action of a person of entity, giving a personal class of person an unfair benefit or detriment in relation to business carried out by the personal class, by providing premature knowledge of proposed or possible action or inaction of a person or entity. Um, and uh, a substantial adverse effect on Australian economy includes substantial adverse effect on a particular sector or a particular part of Australia. And the uh, section uh, 1B uh, includes, but it's not limited to, regulation or supervision of banking insurance and other financial institutions. So clearly the stuff APRA does is going to fall within this. And remember that the commissioner has access to the documents. So they have access to the documents themselves and they can go and receive information from the parties as well. And so there, the, um, the commissioner is satisfied that um, giving the industry risk registries, registers for banking, superannuation and insurance, and releasing those to the um, City Morning Herald would be prejudicial, um, would actually be adverse to the economy of Australia as a result going to have some form of substantial adverse effect. The commissioner determines that. Um, yeah, they get to look at both sides, whereas you as the applicant don't. That's a little bit tricky, that part. So anyway, these are just examples for you guys. So there's two, two of one type, one of another. I said this, I think there's 15 in total. Um, I would, if I were you for your exam, go through, again, use LawSite to just find some examples and to just get some little factual summaries for a bunch of those, half dozen or so. All right, in the last few minutes. Is FOI a good thing? Oh, let's put it in the vote. Who reckons it's good? Who reckons it's bad? Who reckons it's expensive? And who reckons from time to time it's if they get it wrong? or at least the wrong things. It's all of these things are things that people have argued about. And so here, and again, this is the sort of thing that you guys were actually assessed upon, is this arguments for and against having them, having FOI. Main one is dollars. That's the primary argument. FOI, as you could imagine, this, you know, this poor lass that's gone through and spent ages going through creating this document, doing a blitheringly appalling job at it, but nonetheless, it costs the taxpayer a lot of money in doing it. So this, you know, it's, it's difficult in terms of marginal and overhead costs for such things, but you know, this document probably cost the Australian taxpayer, you know, between $500 and $1,000. Um, 
And I personally didn't pay any of that. I did admittedly have to go and seek some more information about it, uh, which probably ended up costing them a bit more in terms of labor and overhead, but it's really expensive. And not only is it expensive in terms of these requests and needing to have the body, the FOI team to do that, it's also the fact that the other departments have to be interrupted and stopped and checked and examined in order for these things to work. I mean, a part of doing your role in anything, like the ATO or, I said, or customs or um, immigration, all of these particular areas, you can be interrupted by you know, FOI team wanting information, wanting to come and ask you questions about stuff. Um, this thing all comes at a cost. Um, and so th this, and again, these reviews that are done periodically, they talk about this balance, this need to really support democratic rights, but, and to you know, give people the freedom, and you know, sunlight is the best disinfectant, but also try to do it at the lowest you know, reasonable cost as a result. So that's the trade-off between it. Um, but we do accept that in terms of legal rights, you know, really you can't do anything. You can't make an appeal. All of your, the legal rights flow from you having the information for you then determine whether it's been done correctly or not, whether you're going to seek some form of um, remedy you know, through their formal appeals process and then later on through the courts. And so there is this, um, uh, this argument, there's this debate about uh, this, and particularly with... Um, uh, information technology, whether or not this, which again clearly was done using some form of template, this could have been literally could have been done better with a script, like an AI script. So I, I personally felt I could have written a better script in about half an hour. But it's, it's the sort of thing that some of these tasks can best be done by software, actually going through and, and doing these uh, mechanical uh, steps and processes. But that's some thoughts. Uh, and finally, Tony Blair famously, in his memoirs, wrote about freedom of information. How he was instrumental in pushing for these changes in the, um, in the mid-90s. And then it came back and bit him on the backside spectacularly. And so he wrote about it in these really emotive terms, uh, which I'll leave you guys, I won't read it all out. But the, the key part is that this is the middle part, that look, while it sounds good in theory and practice from the politician's perspective, it's political entities and journalists, he reckons, are the ones that use this the most. I don't necessarily subscribe to this, but certainly at the top level, it's not the people being empowered, it's other people seeking to subvert the government itself. Um, and that's really problematic. It's that whole idea of, um, you know, we've, we've built up this uh, quite awesome democratic liberal society. We have a lots, of, lots of checks and balances, and we have, as you guys have learned about this whole semester, the system of administrative law, um, but there are some you know, forces that are keen to undermine it. And in many ways, it can be argued that FOI is one of those things that undermines it from within. So, hope that, uh, that this was useful. Uh, useful uh, for you and, and that you picked up some things about FOI, like I said, feel free with, uh, particularly with that uh, document, not to just disseminate that. And um, 